Dennis Mangan, welcome to the Masculine by Design Mancast. Uh, glad we could finally get you on here. I know we were trying to do this for a little while and schedules didn't really line up, uh, but I pre appreciate you joining me today. Uh, how are you doing? I, I'm doing good, Greg. Thanks for having me on. Really appreciate it. Yeah, same here. So I just want to kick things off. I know a lot of the guys that follow me are probably familiar with you. Um, I, I'm sure they follow you on Twitter and whatnot, but I'm sure there are also going to be a lot of guys who listen to this, who watch this on YouTube, who aren't familiar with you. So uh, let's start things off by just having you give a little bit of a background about yourself. And uh, in particular, I'm curious to know what led to you getting so serious about training your body, feeding your body for success, and helping other men to do the same. Uh, okay, um, so uh, I guess I guess uh, you know pertinent to all this is that I'm 63 years old. So uh, you know people people need to know that is relevant to what I'm doing and uh, what I'm writing about and so on. Um, I'm a microbiologist and uh, and so I have this background in science and. Um, I was I've, I've I've long been interested in health and fitness, and it you know in the earlier days I was running and doing that sort of thing, and um, after a period of being ill, um, and in which I couldn't get over it, I decided that I had to uh, figure things out for myself, and I delved into researching it and so on, and I got a lot better, and I'm fine now. Uh, so, it, you know, at some point I thought, well, you know, I should be writing about this because there's a lot of things I'm learning here that people just don't know about. There's a lot of, uh, you know, illness and ill health out there um, that that these things could help. So, I, you know, I just started into it. I, I started out writing a, an ebook about my own particular illness. And then when I was done with that, I thought, well, I'll, I'll just keep going. So so I did. As far as uh, as far as me personally, my my training and and the way I eat and so on, um, like I said, uh, I, I've long been interested in health. Although you know my views have changed radically on on you know what conduces to good health. I think that uh, you know in thinking about all this, uh, how how this came about for for myself. So when I was growing up, uh, my my father had heart disease, so at a, at a relatively young age, right? So it, it, it didn't kill him or anything, but he lived with it for a long time and it affected him uh, very seriously. And, you know, I saw that this, this was, so when I was young, this was the 1960s and this was the middle of a big heart disease epidemic in American men, especially, especially men. Um, I think a lot of younger people around now don't really quite appreciate that, that the, the seriousness of how uh, heart attacks were striking down middle-aged men. So that, that made a big impression on me. Um, and so I decided that, you know, I never wanted that to happen to myself. And, and I set about doing what I could to, to, to uh, do about it, to, to prevent that. Uh, so anyway, uh, fast forward to today, here I am. Like I said, my views have radically changed, but I'm still interested in health and fitness, uh, still still interested in keeping myself in shape, and and I'm still writing about it. It's awesome, and your, your uh, blog is a piece of work, man. I mean that in a good way. There's a ton of great information there. Um, I don't think you mentioned it, but it's roguehealthandfitness.com, so uh, everybody listening, definitely check that out. Now, do you have any kind of a, a backstory in terms of it? Have you ever been – uh, overweight or ob obese and had to lose the weight or what I know you mentioned an illness so what was that uh, pertaining to right so uh, no no well you know I've been overweight a couple times in my life but really never anything very serious uh, that you know never anything that I wasn't able to lose with that with a little bit of attention paid to it um, what happened to me was uh, I had chronic fatigue syndrome and chronic fatigue syndrome is basically it's an illness they, they call it a diagnosis of exclusion. That means basically they can't figure it out. They don't know what's causing it, right? So, you know, fatigue is the most common thing that people go to doctors for. And, and you know, it's the most common complaint, I'm tired. But, you know, just an enormous number of things can cause fatigue. So How long ago when they, was that, uh, So that started when I was in my early 40s. So this is, this is a... 20 years ago. In fact, yeah, it'll be now that I think about it 20 years ago next month that I that I came down with it. I remember it well. 
Um, so anyway, I had this thing and, you know, I, I felt ill and, and went in and it wasn't going away after several weeks and I went to a doctor. Okay, well, I don't feel well, what's going on? And with the expectation, well, you know, the doctor will figure it out and fix it. But uh, he, 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 the doctor couldn't. Um, and, you know, to cut the story to make, without, without drawing this out so much, this happened over and over again. So I, you know, kept going to different doctors, kept trying to figure things out. And um, I never got better. Up until that time, I had been uh, running pretty good distances. I've run a couple of marathons in my life. Um, and I was typically going out and running, uh, you know, five to 10 miles every morning, this kind of thing. Um, and then that, that just stopped because I, I couldn't do that anymore. Anyway, this went on for years, feeling like this, and, and I, I got used to it. I thought, well, this, you know, this is the way it is. I'm just going to have to live with it. Um, but at, at some point, I got a, you know, a glimmer of hope that, you know, maybe, maybe they could figure out something wrong. One, one, one thing is that all this time, going, going to the doctor, they can't, they can't figure out you know, they examine you, they run lab tests and so on, and everything looks normal. And and in chronic fatigue syndrome in particular, this has led uh, people who look into this to basically accuse people of being malingerers and, you know, it's all in your head or whatever, you know. Um, so anyway, uh, long story short, I did a lot of research, tried to figure things out and changed the way I ate. Um, started feeling better and then I decided well if I'm feeling better maybe I can do some exercise and I had decided that if I ever could I wanted to do some weightlifting I had done it a few times in, at different times in my life so I did and I started I started lifting weights and before too long I figured wow I need more weights so I had to join a gym and that's you know that's that's like uh, just about nine years ago that that happened so that's how it went. Yeah, you mentioned that, you know, as you were dealing with that illness, it almost just got to be a new normal for you. And I, I say that all the time about my own journey. Cause I, I was obese at one point, uh, 250 ish pounds and uh, was always fit until I got into college. And then my studies and partying kind of took over and diet and uh, nutrition and training went by the wayside and uh, put on the weight and took it off. But what's interesting when I look back at that period of my life is that that really, I had no idea until I took that weight off what was waiting for me on the other side. I just assumed the way I felt was the way everybody else felt. And uh, one thing to kick this podcast off that I want guys listening to understand is that, you know, if you are overweight, if, if you are dealing with issues kind of like what Dennis talked about or, or worse, maybe you have blood pressure problems, other health problems, uh, there is a better, a better way. There is light on the other side. And uh, what we're going to talk about today is, is going to help you to see that. Now, Dennis, you mentioned you're 63 years old, and one of the things that intrigues me about you is, you know, I look at the pictures that you post on your website or on Twitter, uh, you have a, a body that looks nothing like what the typical 63-year-old <laughs> looks like, and obviously, you're treating it well through training and nutrition, and so you have a lot of value to offer there, and so I want to I talk to you about these things. Uh, first, I want to dig into what, what you're doing right now. What does is, what is your diet look like? Uh, at this point in time? Um, okay, yeah, good question. Um, you know, uh, one thing, just just to back up a little bit to what you just said here, uh, it, it's really true. A lot of people think that the way they are, the way they feel is just normal, and, and you know, it doesn't have to be that way. I mean, some, sometimes I, I have the feeling like, wow, I, I feel so good. I can't believe this. I, why do I feel so good? And, and most people aren't experiencing that. Um, but anyway, so as far as as far as uh, what my diet is like, so I eat a low carbohydrate diet. Um, that doesn't mean 100 percent of the time, you know, uh, there's occasional cheating. But I'd say, you know, most days I'm probably eating under 50 grams of carbohydrates. So that's getting into ketogenic diet territory. Um, I think most important because because I get asked this question a lot, you know, people like say young guys who are fit and they're lifting weights and so on. And they say, well, what about carbohydrates? Because I, I really am, you know, not a huge fan of, of eating a lot of carbohydrates. And I, so what I tell people is if you're, if you're lean and you're healthy and you exercise a lot, 
yeah, go ahead. You can you can stand some to use some carbohydrates, you know. But if any one of those three do not apply to you, then be very careful. So uh, I want to emphasize that. Another thing that's very important, and I've come to appreciate this more and more in in recent years, is staying away from ultra processed food. So I stay away from ultra processed food. So now to to explain this to the audience. Ultra processed food is basically most things that come in a box or a bag that you find in the middle aisles of the supermarket. They're the manufactured, factory, you know, factory made foods that the big food companies make. We're all familiar with them. Um, you know, a bag of Doritos, a, a bag of cookies, um, and and even things you don't necessarily think of as junk food, like uh, graham crackers, was something I tweeted about the other day. Um, so these, these things are, in my opinion, what's causing the obesity epidemic. And there have been studies that have shown that, that on average, Americans ingest 60% of their calories as ultra processed foods. So that, that's really bad news, uh, in my view. So as far as my diet goes and what I urge people to do is to eat whole minimally processed foods. So every, I have to say, uh, you know, minimally processed because virtually every food is processed in some way or another. You know, it's not, nothing, nothing's just, unless you're pulling an apple off a tree and eating it, you know, then, then something's happened to it. Right. So minimally processed, whole foods. So you want to avoid the things that have large amounts of refined grains and anything with sugar and uh, vegetable oils, which are seed oils, as I as I've talked a lot about, and I can go into that more if if you want to later. Um, so what I eat is I eat a lot of meat, and I eat some dairy. Uh, I I believe fermented dairy is a better choice over just milk. So I eat cheese and yogurt. Um, cook things in butter. Um, I put cream in my coffee, that kind of thing. Uh, I eat vegetables, uh, basically non-starchy vegetables, things like uh, broccoli and and cauliflower um, and uh, some cooked onions, that that sort of thing. Salads, and um, I drink coffee and tea. I drink red wine, um, and I'm trying to think. You know, that about covers it. I mean, a typical meal will be some kind of meat. Uh, vegetables and it doesn't doesn't vary a lot really I mean I kind of like you know eggs for breakfast that that's maybe separates breakfast from the others but that that's what I typically eat yeah no it's interesting you talk about the ultra processed foods and you know what you're talking about you're eating right these nutrient dense foods you can eat a lot of them they're, right. they're not high in calories uh, for the amount of food you're intaking uh, yeah it's very easy with these ultra ultra processed foods to to eat them and you never feel full you you're you're getting all these calories and a lot of it's sugar uh, or refined sugar more precisely and it's not filling you up it's not providing your body with with the fuel that it needs to perform or to heal or to recover and right. uh, it's no surprise that with what we see in the supermarkets and you know a lot of people will will talk about how cheap processed foods are but at the end of the day, uh, from the people that I see, the amount that they're eating compared to what they would have to eat if they were eating uh, health-promoting foods, the, the cost difference is negligible. Right. It, it, yes, it's absolutely true. These things are, uh, ultra-processed foods are highly profitable because the ingredients in them are just very cheap. And uh, these manufacturers can make, make up these things, stamp a brand name on them and advertise them, sell them for a lot of money. So yeah, very, very profitable foods. Yeah, and from, from uh, the amount of research that I've done, which is somewhat limited as of late, uh, the government is subsidizing a lot of those ingredients that go into those foods, which just promote those manufacturers to use them all the more. Right. Yes, absolutely. So have you always been a proponent of low carb eating or is this something you've kind of come into? Uh, it, yeah, so it's something I know. So not always. And, uh, but, but it's something that, um, over the last, you know, eight to 10 years, I've gotten into more and more. Um, I used to be a vegetarian. So uh, this, this was this was back in the day. So this is more more than 10 years ago that I'm talking about. 12 years ago, maybe now. Um, and so I ate a high carb diet. And 
but I did eat uh, pretty much uh, pretty much not ultra ultra processed foods, right? So I I was eating whole foods. I I ate what is you know presented to the public as as a healthy diet, right? You know things things like uh, brown rice and lots of vegetables and beans and you know that sort of thing. Fruit. Um, yeah, sure, exactly. Um, and uh, you know wh what's happened with the what changed my mind about uh, going, you know, going more low carb aside from giving up vegetarianism was just a lot of the research that I've done that, that, that shows that it, um, it, it slows the aging process, that it's a healthier thing to do as far as not having those glucose and insulin spikes that happen when you eat a large amount of, of, of carbohydrates. And so, and I, you know, I just prefer it. I feel better on it. Um, I don't get uh, any kind of, a, you know, I have e even keel energy all the time. Sure. Now I, I know uh, at times I don't eat a real carb heavy diet, uh, but I do eat, I eat more than you. I would say maybe a hundred to 150 grams on, if, on a training day. Um, and what I've noticed when I've tried to go low carb for an extended period of time is that my energy in the gym suffers. And I have guys tell me that, you know, you'll get over that. Your body just kind of has to adapt to, you know, using more fats for energy. Is, is that, uh, is that what you've experienced as well? Or Yes. I, you know, I, I, at times I, I feel very little, uh, difference personally and whether, you know, whether I eat carbs or whether I haven't been eating carbs and going to the gym. Um, the thing is about, uh, doing high intensity exercise, like weightlifting. So when, when you, when you exercise, obviously you're burning energy, but the more high intensity the exercise is, the more you're burning glycogen, you know, your, your stored carbohydrate. Um, the thing is we, the, the body holds, uh, you, you know, what's the number, like a couple of thousand calories worth of glycogen, something like that. Uh, typically it, it can vary tremendously based on what somebody's eating, how big they are, et cetera, et cetera. But you know, that's a ballpark figure. So you don't really need a full tank of glycogen, uh, to do a bout of high intensity exercise. I mean, sure. If you were, if you were doing it like all day long, yeah, you, you'd run out of gas. Um, but I, my, my weightlifting sessions are uh, typically no more than about 30 minutes. I, I find I have plenty of energy in the gym. As far as, you know, in particular, your question, um, what happens when you go without carbohydrates is, is your body will upregulate the enzymes and other processes uh, that go into burning fat. And, and you, you, will, um, you will get to a point where even though you're doing high intensity exercise, such as weightlifting, the proportion of carbohydrates that you're burning drops. So you, you burn more fat during that time. So fat adaptation, um, you, that's how it works. Okay. Now, um, I hadn't planned to ask you this, but uh, I, I did want to ask you this. Now, I'm actually on a fast right now. I'm about 23 hours in. And, uh, you know, talking about food right now is uh, definitely making my <laughs> mouth water a little bit. Uh, do, do you, are you a proponent of fasting, extended fasting, you know, 18, 24 or more hours? At, at, absolutely, I am, and I do it myself uh, a lot. Uh, although personally, I've never gone over 24 hours fasting, and you know, I hear I hear people, uh, I know people that, uh, you know, that do extended fast days days long and so on. Uh, but what I'm talking about here is in, intermittent fasting, say between 16 and 24 hours. Typically, I will fast. Uh, say a 16 hour fast i do that quite often several times a week and, and then and then less often i'll go 18 20 22 hours uh yeah i'm i'm definitely a proponent of it uh it it's great on a number of levels for uh for fat loss it's good and uh it has it has an anti-aging effect so it it sets in in motion all kinds of physiological processes that basically clean you up and make you more youthful and and slow down the aging process, or depending on where you are exactly, maybe even reverse the aging process. So yes, I'm a big proponent of it. 
Yeah, I, I really like it as well. And same with intermittent fasting. I, I, it just fits with, with uh, a busy person's lifestyle so much better. You're not having to worry about eating every few hours. Uh, I, I do it to where I don't eat breakfast. So in the mornings, I'm busy. I, I'm not hungry anyway. Same, oh, yeah. yeah, same. Ab absolutely. I'm not hungry in the morning. It's very easy to skip breakfast. Just have a cup of coffee. And um, yeah, you know, it's funny you, you bring that up about eating all the time because, you know, people are eating all the time. Uh, you know, I mean, most people I know, they can't imagine going more than a few hours without food. It's, it's, yeah, it's, it's too bad. But anyway, that, that that's the situation. Yeah, I find it easier too. You know, when I'm when I'm trying to cut fat, it's just easier because I'm I'm eating fewer meals throughout the day, so it's it's less opportunity for me to eat more than I need to in order to achieve that goal. Right. Yes. Absolutely. So, Dennis, do you change uh, your diet for? So I know you're uh, one of your big focuses right now is you know anti aging, being youthful. Um, you, you mentioned that's one of the big reasons why you like the low carb strategy. Do you cycle your nutrition at all versus when you want to build muscle or lose fat or you kind of stay at a pretty steady? Uh, it's it's more or less calorie. steady. I, it's, it's more or less steady. I, I, I do eat more on a training day as, as I suppose most people do. Uh, and, and so uh, I, you know, I try to, I try to get plenty of protein and calories on a training day. I drink a whey protein drink. Uh, immediately after my workout so uh, you know that that's a difference there so I only do that a couple couple times a week when I work out I take the whey shake because I want to make sure that I'm getting enough protein you know you basically you're flooding your muscles with amino acids right right when they're just primed to take them up um, and then and then on my uh, off gym days you know I'll be more likely to be doing intermittent fasting um, and so on. So, the, you know, so I don't cycle, you know, just from day to day, those are, those are the variations. Okay. So it, for a guy who wants to follow kind of the approach you're taking, uh, 50 or less carbs per day, lots of uh, green veggies, nu nutritious, uh, cruciferous vegetables, uh, lean proteins, or actually you didn't say lean protein, so I don't want to speak for you, but, but proteins, uh, what would they do if they wanted to switch? Let's say that they, they've come off a, a fat cutting cycle if you will and they want to start putting on muscle mass is that just a matter of increasing their protein intake or would you have a different strategy in mind i i think it is largely a matter of increasing their protein intake uh you know one one very important concept that i i've learned over the past couple of years is the idea of protein protein to energy ratio so uh when you when you ingest more protein, uh, like like let's let's take a, uh, an example of a piece of lean meat, right? Uh, a really lean piece might be say a chicken breast, um, but they're you know they're lean pieces of beef and so on. So that has a high ratio of protein to energy, and this is this is what will help you build muscle without putting on fat is is having that extra protein. There there's uh, there, there's a sort of, uh, I don't know if I'd call it a myth, but, um, you know, there's this idea that, you know, you can take in so much protein, like say whatever the number is you're talking about, 1.5 grams per kilogram or two grams per kilogram, you know, people use different figures, but, you know, you sh the idea is, n but no more than that. And I think that's wrong, actually. Um, I think that there is no harm at all in doing it and and possibly benefit in going to very high protein. Now, I, you know, I don't think I really necessarily get into that high area myself, but um, the upshot, what I'm trying to say is protein is good, eat plenty of it, and here, here's another thing um, I'll throw in about low carbohydrate or ketogenic diets is a lot of people out there have this idea that this consists of just chowing down on a lot of fat and and putting your getting yourself into ketosis and I think that's a mistake. Um, you you often hear people say, "Well, I went on the ketogenic diet and I can't lose weight." What's you know I suppose I thought this is supposed to be magic or something like that. Well, um, it is very effective, but if, you know, if you're in ingesting these, you know, what they call fat bombs, 
uh, like bulletproof coffee with a stick of butter in it or something like that. You know, that you, you really, you know, calories still matter in that sense. You know, if you're ingesting a whole lot of that stuff, you're not going to lose fat. So, um, so the two points there are, are uh, be sure you get plenty of protein and watch the fat intake. So would you agree with the statement that uh, regardless of what you're eating, whether it's low carb, moderate carb, high carb, uh, whatever strategy you're following, if your calories are, ex- your calories consumed is exceeding the calories uh, shed off or burned off, you're still going to be in a state of uh, massing weight or gaining mass. Right, right. That, that, is, that is correct. The, the thing is, is that, um, this this is a uh, this this concept of calories in calories out is a, is a statement of what's what's happening and it it's it's certainly true if you're ingesting more calories than than you are burning metabolizing then you are certainly going to put on weight you know the question is the the more the more pertinent question is how is it best to have uh, you know a lower calorie intake. And, and for, so for people who are counting calories, it's often very difficult because if you're just eating the same thing as before, only less of it, you're going to be hungry. And the thing to do is, is to abolish that hunger, to, to make it, to eat the kind of foods that are nutrient dense, that satisfy you, that make you so you're not hungry. And so what, you know, what's interesting in, in, um, when you read some of these uh, studies that, that have been done on, on you know, randomized controlled studies on low carbohydrate diets, what, what they often report is spontaneous reduction of calories. So when people go from a standard American diet with all the ultra processed food and the high carb and so on and start eating a low carbohydrate diet, they're just less hungry and they don't want to eat as much. And then so their calorie intake drops and they lose weight. Yeah, it's important to, uh, cause I, I see that same thing where guys will go low carb and they think because they're a low carb, they can just eat as much food as they want. That's why I asked you the question. Cause I've, I've seen that as well. And they, they get frustrated. It's like, well, look, man, you're still eating 3,500, 4,000 calories a day just because you're not eating that many carbs. Uh, you're still not going to be losing weight or losing fat while you're still eating like that, uh, right. that, that volume of calories. Uh, now, Dennis, so you're, you're 63 and you mentioned, you know, going through kind of that illness, uh, I think you said 20 years ago. Um, so as you've been focused on fitness and, and nutrition and figuring out what works best for your body, um, there's kind of a, a decent time span there. So for guys who are listening to this, who are maybe younger than you, maybe they're, they're 20, 25, 30, um, is there any advice or different strategy you might employ for somebody at a younger age than what you would recommend for somebody uh, closer to your age? Well, uh, you know, so um, some of the things that I do, uh, like take the intermittent fasting, for example, um, you, the, these these processes that that uh, it it increases in, in in the body are something that help keep you youthful. Um, for a young man, you in in any in any uh, person, in any human being, in fact, in any animal, in any organism. Basically, you know, youth is characterized by the ability to get away with a whole lot of stuff that you can't get away with when you're older. And so I think maybe maybe some of the younger guys may, might not see the importance of it, uh, especially guys who are, are, you know, generally fit, right? They say, well, hey, look, I'm in shape, but, you know, I, I exercise, lift weights, whatever, you know, and, and I'm pr- pretty lean and so on. So, you know, I don't care. I don't I you know, I get by in five hours of sleep and go partying uh, all night long on Saturday night and, you know, eat bags of Doritos and I'm fine, you know, so I don't I care. That, uh, that, was, uh, that describes me in high, in high school and then I hit college and it uh, didn't work quite as well. Uh, uh, right. So, um, you know, it just, it just depends on the, on the person, I think, you know, if they're, health, if they're health conscious, you know, pay attention. There isn't anything really all that different that I would tell a younger person to do. Um, you know, and so if, if you want to be health conscious, do these things. And also, I guess I'll throw in there, a lot of younger people today are really not in very good shape. 
um, you know, the, the obesity epidemic is widespread. It's at all ages and it's all over the place, right? So um, probably mo most younger men or many younger men could, could heed the kind of stuff that I'm saying and be better off for it. Sure. I want to talk to you about that, uh, the, the obesity epidemic that we're seeing, in particular with children. So I, I posted something on Twitter the other day, and I think it was yesterday, and I basically said if, if there's a child who is fat, they're a victim of child abuse. That, that child doesn't know any better. It's eating what the, what the parent is feeding them. And I got a, mostly positive feedback, you know, saying, yeah, amen, brother, that kind of stuff. But then I also had some guys who were like, hey, you know, you shouldn't say that. You know, a lot of these kids have genetic uh, issues that are causing them to be uh, overweight or obese. And I want to get your thoughts on that. Do you, you think that's valid? I mean, because as, as, as far as I'm concerned, yes, uh, a child can have genetic abnormalities. They can be more predisposed to storing body fat. But at the end of the day, you can still overcome that through an effective uh, diet and not eating too many calories. Right. So uh, the, regarding the genetic thing, I mean, you, you, you know, I hear this sort of thing, too. And the thing is, uh, you know, 40, let's see, so 40 years ago, there was no obesity epidemic in this country, and the genes were pretty much all the same. So what, what has happened is not genetic, right? The, the gene pool has remained largely the same, but now, now a huge, huge uh, numbers of people are overweight or obese, including, as you say, children. So I don't really buy the genetic thing. Yes, if you're in our food environment and you have a certain set of genes, yes, you may be more likely to uh, become overweight or obese. But what's going on there? It's the food environment that's changed. So to change, you know, change the food environment and all that goes away. We're, we're, we're not, um, human beings and, and other animals are not, uh, designed by evolution to become obese. Our genes are, 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 our genes were developed in an environment in which food was relatively scarce or we didn't eat all the time anyway, not, not with this 24 seven abundance of junk food that we have now. So to, to be lean and healthy, it's necessary to understand what our genes are, are uh, what environment our genes were developed in and, and to give that environment to them and you're supposed to function well. Animals in the wild do not become overweight or obese. It's a, it's a severe disability, right? You, I mean, if, if you can't outrun that predator or if you're a predator and you can't catch your, your prey, then you know, you're not going to live, you're not going to survive and reproduce, right? So being overweight is a severe liability. So, you know, they, it just doesn't happen. Yeah. And I imagine some of these uh, individuals who have kind of lashed out at me a little bit, they may be parents who, who have children who are obese or, or overweight. And, uh, you know, one thing, this may sound extreme, but, you know, uh, try putting your kid on, on eating nothing but broccoli. I, I promise you they, they will no longer be obese or overweight after a period of time, right? Right, right. But Number one, you can't do that. You know, <laughs> there's always this, you know, you can't do that. Um, and then, uh, yeah, the other thing is that, you know, these days on Twitter or anywhere, you're, you're going to find people that are going to get offended at anything you say. Everything. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. You, you say you say men should take more responsibility and, you know, people lash out at you. If you, if, yep. if you say, you know, men have too much responsibility, they lash out at you. Just, yeah, right. You got to learn to have thick skin anymore. Yep. So you talked a little bit earlier about, uh, you know, eating in such a way that you're, you're achieving your goals, you're able to lose fat if that's, that's what you're working toward without being hungry. And you touched on that a little bit. And you actually have a, a posting that I read while I was researching uh, for this podcast that's specifically titled, titled How to Lose Weight Without Hunger. Uh, so can you delve into that a little bit more? I mean, what, because that's a big thing for people. You know, I, I hear that a lot as well. It's like, you know what, in order to lose fat, I have to restrict my calories to such a degree that it's impossible to follow because I'm just feeling hungry all day. And, and you know, I, I would take exception to that to an extent. I mean, right, like I said, I'm fasted right now for 23 hours. I'm hungry. But at the end of the day, you make a decision and you stick to that decision not to eat if, if, or you, you stick to that decision not to eat that many calories if that's what you're, what you're doing. But, uh, but 
I also think why suffer needlessly if you don't have to, right? So, uh, so what are some strategies people who are, who are worried about being hungry can employ? Right. So uh, when, when people, you know, a, a standard sort of low calorie reducing diet is, is you know, it's, it's, they're eating the same things, only they're reducing portions or, or, or something like that. Now, a strategy that you're doing right now, intermittent fasting, is very much different from that. That that's that's just uh, okay. I'm not going to eat for X number of hours, and and that's a that's a more solid way uh, of of going about things. Um, you know, when you see you see uh, here, you know, here's a, a diet meal plan, and it allows for three meals a day and a morning snack and an afternoon snack. There's something about people people feeling the need to, to eat all the time, to eat every few hours or something. It's just, I, I find it weird. Well, you'll go catabolic, uh, Dennis, if you don't eat every three hours, <laughs> you lose muscle mass, right? That's right. Um, so, so intermittent fasting is one, one solid strategy like, like you're doing. Um, the other is to change what you eat. So if you're eating, um, if you're eating whole foods, so uh, let me back up a little bit. The ultra processed foods that most people are eating, they're designed by food companies to taste just like, oh, that tastes like more, I want more. It, they, they want you going back to their product. It, they, they de delivering these dopamine hits that make you go, wow, that tasted good. You know, give me another cupcake, whatever. And, and it, it's very much on purpose. Um, so, and, and you know, even the similar foods that we make at home, that in olden days used to be reserved for either dessert or a special occasion or something like that, like a piece of cake or something like that. It's the same thing. It's a certain combination of ingredients that make you go, oh my God, that tastes good. And, and so that's the stuff that, that people need to get rid of and, and to exclude them from their diet if they're trying to lose weight. Uh, and, and when you switch to a diet like I've been talking about, whole minimally processed foods with plenty of protein, natural fats, some green vegetables, and so on. This is this, it's going to make you less hungry. You cut cut out these refined carbohydrates and sugar, and and people are going to be less hungry. They, it's just uh, it's just how it works. When I when I went to when I first started eating low carb, well before I started eating low carb. I'd get up, I'd have breakfast in the morning and, you know, maybe a bowl of cereal or something like I used to eat back then. By noon, I was like, oh my God, is it time to eat lunch yet? I, I'm starving. And, and when I went to the way I eat now, it, it just really changes your sensation of hunger. And it's, it's difficult to describe to somebody who hasn't experienced it, but it, you just don't feel it in the same way, that same urgency. You say, oh, you know, all of a sudden you look at the clock, wait, oh, I missed lunch, I forgot, something like that. Yeah, no, I, so, I, I think those, just like you described too, those foods that they, they light up those pleasure centers in your brain. It's, it's, it's almost like, uh, you know, I've, I've heard people refer to it, I don't know if it's the same, you know, level of addiction, but they, they all liken it. it's like a crack addiction or, or heroin or something like that. It's like where you, your, your body craves that intense pleasure and that you, you're not even hungry. That's what, that's what fasting has really taught me is what real hunger is. You know, I used to think after three hours, right. I want to eat, but I'm, I'm not really hungry. It's just, uh, I'm bored or it's something to do or it's something pleasurable, right? I'm right. not really hungry. Right. There's all these psychological cues that go into eating. Um, you, like you say, you, you know, you're bored or you know, it's, it's pleasurable, like, oh, I'm, you know, I haven't had anything pleasurable in a couple of hours. So I'll, you know, put something in my mouth that, the, you know, that makes me feel that pleasure. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And, and, and as far as the, what you're saying about like the, like the sugar. So um, the, com the combination of sugar and fat is, is the most addictive thing there is, you know, in animal experiments, in human experiments, you know, so basically sugar plus fat is dessert. And that's, that's what just really lights up those, those pleasure centers in the brain, makes you want more, makes you can't, can't stop eating it and so on. So yeah, that, that's it. That'll do it. Yeah. 
All right. So I want to shift gears a little bit, uh, still probably along the nutrition, although I'm sure there's some training involved with uh, this topic as well. So I want to talk anti-aging. So I know you're not the only guy out, out there talking about anti-aging, but I do find that you have a pretty uh, unique voice when it comes to that. And uh, I, while I might be a little younger than you, that's still something that's a very big deal to me. I think it's a big deal to, to everybody, every man who listens to this. I mean, we're all going to age, right? No matter, no matter what. And uh, no matter what, we're all going to die. We're all going to break down. But if we can slow that process down and extend that quality of life uh, for a little bit longer, I think that uh, that's definitely an ideal that we should strive for. Um, so uh, what was it that, that led you down this path of kind of looking into strategies for anti-aging? You know, it's, it's kind of hard to say, but I've, I've had an interest in it for a long time. Um, I, I would say that... Um, so yeah, so I've been I've been you know reading and studying about it for uh, 25 years, something like that. Um, back in, you know back in the day, they used to think that uh, oh, taking anti antioxidants was going to slow aging and so on, and you know that's that's just long gone. That doesn't work completely. Um, pretty much completely, yes. Uh, I, I hadn't heard that. Yeah, so you, pe pe they used to think oh, to take vitamin C, vitamin E, beta carotene. You know that's going to do it, and no, it doesn't. And and that, there's actually a very good reason that we know now why it doesn't, and that is because the body needs the body needs stresses, periodic stresses to stay in to stay in good condition, like the stress of exercise and so on, and other stresses, hormesis is called, and those vitamins, vitamin C, E, and, and beta carotene, and some others dampen that whole process. Uh, they found that if you take, uh, take large amounts of vitamin C uh, over a fairly long term, it just totally dampens the, the effects of exercise as far as you know, increasing your VO2 max and so on and so forth. So the whole antioxidant thing, it doesn't work. There's even been some epidemiological studies where they've looked at um, people who take antioxidant vitamins and they actually have a slightly higher death rate than people who don't. So that, that doesn't work. So now Dennis, um, I feel like I've, I've heard or read about, you know, studies where, and then, you know, of course, whether it's done on humans or rats or something like that, I, I don't remember, but you know, we're going to talk about, you know, coffee and the antioxidants in coffee or red wine. You said you, you like to drink red wine and those are heavy in antioxidants. Is there, so is there, there is still benefit to ingesting antioxidants right just to right so, understand what you're saying right so that's a that's a very good point um and the the thing is when you talk about the antioxidants in coffee or red wine or anything else they're not really antioxidants and really if if you read any kind of mainstream thing that that uh that talks about that you can you can safely dismiss it what they have are compounds called polyphenols. So polyphenols are uh, compounds that plants make uh, to, you know, basically defend themselves. Um, you know, plants can't move, they can't run away, so they use chemical warfare to defend themselves against predators, anything that wants to eat them. So that's where these polyphenols come in. Um, and they they induce a response in us when when we take them and one of one of the responses that they induce is is an ant is an internal antioxidant response so we have our own internal antioxidant system glutathione superoxide dismutase there's a there's a whole uh, a slew of things that that keeps this under control. So when you do things like say, drink that cup of coffee with the polyphenols in it, it upregulates up our stress defense mechanisms. So in that's, that's what these things are doing. Antioxidants themselves, like say large doses of vitamin C, they, they dampen that whole process and, and basically downregulate our strength, stress defense mechanisms. So that's what that's all about. They're not really antioxidants in coffee. It's something else going on there. That's interesting. Thanks for clarifying that. I hadn't heard that before. Right. Um, all right. So I got you off track a little bit. So yeah, sure. Uh, back to the anti-aging uh, train. So how, how did that uh, how did that all come about? 
Well, uh, you know, I, I just uh, uh, got into it and, and, you know, out of my own interest, I, ha I have a lot of interests. <laughs> I've, I've basically spent half my life reading, you know, so I, I've got a lot of interests and that's one of them. And, and of course, it's a personal interest because uh, I age, we all age, and why would you want to do something about that if possible? I, I look at the whole idea of anti-aging as akin to um, anything else you would do for your health or, or even the most basic things, like, like you know, fastening a safety belt when, when you get in the car to go driving or looking both ways when you go across the street. It's just an extension of, of being healthy and, you know, and, and safe and so on. So when I, when I got more serious about researching it, I, I just find there's, there's a lot of things that, uh, that, that do fight aging. Um, and there's a lot of things that, that most people don't know about it, hence hence my writing about it. I think there's a there's a lot to be to be told there. Um, you know, some of the some of those things are very counterintuitive, and even when even when scientists first started uh, looking at them, discovering them, they were very surprised. But now they're they're well uh, understood, or 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 they're they're agreed upon. Um, so calorie restriction and intermittent fasting are, are two of those. They're both kind of two sides of the same coin. Way back when, 80 years ago, a scientist had a bunch of rats in his laboratory and he fed them a lot less. And wow, they lived a long time, a lot longer. And, and so, wow, what's this, you know? And so that was the beginning of all this study. And now calorie restriction is seen as at least in laboratory animals as the most robust anti-aging intervention there is uh, when you give animals less food even a lot less food then they live longer um, it isn't terribly feasible for human beings or at least that's the thinking there are some people that practice calorie restriction I mean, they you know carefully very carefully uh, adjusting macronutrient ratios and calories and so on and staying ultra lean and all this kind of stuff but they do report a lot of problems like being cold low libido um, you know there are concerns about frailty and so on so it's it's really it does have some some downsides to it definitely intermittent fasting seems to get you most of the upside without any of the downside uh, it, it's it's uh, increasing all the processes that you want to increase um, autophagy is is uh, the main one basically cleaning out your cells by intermittent fasting so intermittent fasting is just the solid anti-aging strategy um, you know lots of other things there there's a lot of research on various um, drugs and chemicals that that could possibly uh, slow the aging process so it's a fascinating field it's going forward straight ahead there are Biotech startups, the people trying, hoping they'll make a lot of money doing this kind of thing with new discoveries and so on. So it's a, it's a rapidly progressing field. So I want to talk to you a little bit later on about supplementation, but uh, in uh, in regards to anti aging, are there any supplements that you found to be useful uh, for that? Well, um, you know, it's hard to say, like personally, what you know, what they do you wouldn't necessarily feel them over over a short term um, but there are a number of supplements berberine for example is one it's it's very similar to the the drug metformin berberine is an uh, anti-diabetic uh, substance it, it it's over the counter here uh, it's it's not a prescription drug but in China it's widely used uh, by diabetics and so um, there, yeah. So there's berberine and and metformin. There's gonna metformin is a prescription anti-diabetic drug. There's there's a clinical trial in humans that's planned for this at for anti-aging purposes. Rapamycin is also a drug that that's um, a lot of scientists who study study this think that that's that's pretty much the holy grail as far as drugs go. Um, you know, other other supplements uh, that I take personally, 
like vitamin K2, very important, and it's kind of hard to get, so I prefer to supplement it. Vitamin D, we're in the winter time, it's hard to get vitamin D, so I take that. Um, I take resveratrol, so resveratrol is a, a supplement uh, that has anti-aging properties. Um, they Maybe 10 years ago, scientists thought resveratrol was gonna be a very big deal, enthusiasm is uh, dampened down quite a bit on it but nevertheless i i find it useful and i and i do take it yeah i know a lot of people will um i don't want to say defend that's that's the word that comes to mind is not the best word but defend the consumption of red wine or, or copious amounts of red wine because it does have resveratrol in it right so so the the amount of resveratrol in red wine is actually quite low hmm. so it the Basically, it's a totality of these polyphenols that are in red wine. They're, you know, doing the health aspect of it. But I mean, there's like five milligrams of resveratrol in a whole bottle of red wine, whereas, you know, typically a supplement will have a couple hundred milligrams in it. Right. All right, Dennis. So got a lot of good information there about nutrition, anti-aging. Uh, let's talk training now. Okay. So, uh, I believe if I, if I saw correctly, I think you, you did reference this a little bit earlier that uh, you don't train very much, at least relative to what most people uh, train their bodies, how, how long they spend in the gym. I think if I remember right, you posted that, that you basically train three 30 minute sessions. That's, that's uh, the totality of your, of your training for, for a given week. And like I said, you have a, a fantastic physique. I mean, you're, you're wearing a lot of clothes right now, but uh, those of you, Check out the website, man. He, he uh, has, a, has a physique that most 20-year-olds would be proud to have. Um, so is that true? Is it just 30, three 30-minute sessions, or do I have, have that a little wrong? It, it's, a, it's actually two 30-minute sessions a week. Um, so, better. yeah, yeah. Uh, so I, I used to, not, not that long ago, maybe uh, just, just three, four years ago, I, I, I was doing uh, high-volume training, you know, conventional training like most people do. And I, I was converted to high intensity training. I, I just found it uh, so compelling and I took it up. Um, so, so yeah, so I, I do two 30 minute sessions a week. I do a two way split. So I'm doing one split one day, one the other day. Uh, and, and high intensity training for those who don't know what it is, is uh, it, it's pretty much what it sounds like. Um, in, in, in high intensity training, the, the basic rule is doing an exercise, one set of an exercise to complete failure. So you, you, whatever exercise you're doing, um, you, you pick a weight that, you know, I, I can go into a lot of detail here, uh, you know, uh, but basically the number of reps you do is not as nearly as important as the fact that you keep doing reps until you cannot do another rep. And the idea is that at that point, the anabolic stimulus to your muscles is that's as much as you're going to get and that you get little to no extra stimulus by resting a little bit and then doing another set. Um, if you do get more stimulus, it's definitely a case of diminishing returns. You, you, you're going to get the biggest bang for your buck on that first set that you're going to absolute mus muscular failure. And so then another aspect of it is uh, I move between exercises very quickly. Uh, I, don't, I don't rest between sets other than to you know, break down equipment or load the next, the next uh, piece of equipment. You just do it. You get in there, uh, and, and and you you work out to failure on one exercise. Then you move to the next exercise. So, what what you're doing in this case is you're you're not only getting a uh, a weightlifting workout, a muscular workout, but you're getting a cardiovascular workout too. So, um, what what happens to me, and I think probably is the case with most people who do high intensity training is that at the end of about 30 minutes or however long your session is, you're, you're pretty spent. Um, you know, you, you, you're thinking that, well, okay, I did it. I, can, I really can't do any more. So that, that's what I do. Two 30 minute sessions a week uh, on my off gym days. I just walk, you know, I, I 
believe you need plenty of recovery. Certainly at my age, you need more recovery than, than someone who's younger. So that's what I do. So any, any high intensity cardio or anything like that? Just, just low intensity walking? Low intensity walking. I do, uh, I do some metabolic finishers at the end of my weightlifting workouts. So I'll do, uh, for example, maybe just uh, one 20 second bout on the cycle all out to the point where at the end of it, I'm very much out of breath, have a high heart rate and so on. Um, but if for, in the main, I, I allow my, um, my, my weight workout to, to be my cardiovascular workout. And yes, yeah, so so the rest of the time it's just walking. That's on my office. Well, I, I know you have some programs on your site, which we'll talk about in a little uh, little bit here, but uh, definitely a very marketable uh, approach to training. So I think a lot, of, a lot of guys would prefer to, uh, if they can look like you and spend an hour in the gym each week uh, lifting weights, I think that's uh, something a lot of guys would prefer. Yeah, yeah, I think, I think the idea that you have to spend uh, you know, basically hours weekly, if you, if you want to have any progress, it, you know, it, it, it keeps people from, from taking it up. You know, there, there are probably a lot of, a lot of men out there who think, yeah, I should be doing it, but you know, I, I can't be spending five hours a week in the gym or whatever it is. So I'm not going to do it. So yes, this, hopefully this would, would help people take it up. Yeah, I, absolutely. I'm, I'm sure it will. Uh, so I want to talk too about the benefits of training that are beyond just the way that we look. So we've, we've alluded to this a little bit in the discussion so far, but you know, a lot of guys, they start training and feeding their body in a certain way because they want to elicit some kind of a result on their physique. But there are also a number of benefits that guys can expect to receive from weight training that go beyond just the way that they look. Uh, can you talk about some of those Dennis? Well, sure. Um, you know, they, they, they say that if exercise were a pill, every doctor would prescribe it to everyone. It, it's just what, you know, the most solid thing that anybody can be doing for their health. Uh, you know, aside, aside from eating a good diet, exercise is the other, the other thing. So uh, they're, they're, for example, as far as anti-aging goes, it, it's been shown that uh, exercise capacity in the form of VO2 max is is one of the most is one of the just the strongest uh, components of people you know men in this case in particular living long into their 90s the men who lived into their 90s had a good exercise capacity so uh, you know exercise is just is just the best thing you can do uh, that way as far as uh, in particular for lifting weights one of the things that happens, I, I think this is very uh, <clears throat> unappreciated or underappreciated by most people, or maybe even unknown, is that as people age, they lose muscle. So th this is this is a very natural progression. It's been shown even as early as about age thirty, uh, men are starting to lose muscle, women too, and and this accelerates as they age, and and this this is. Uh, really bad news for health. Uh, in, in an extreme case, in old age, uh, you know, men by the age of 80, if they do nothing about it, they can have lost a full half of all the muscle that they had when they were younger. And uh, this is bad news metabolically. And in, like I say, in an extreme case, in old age, it leads to frailty. People literally can't get up out of the chair that they're in, and so on. Um, at, at a younger age, say in, in middle age, the loss of muscle uh, you know, pr promotes metabolic problems like uh, diabetes and insulin resistance because mu muscle is just a very important, it, it, it's, a, it's a large part of our body, um, skeletal muscle, right? And when we lose it, we lose that metabolic flexibility and metabolic capacity. So it, to my mind, uh, Anybody who's serious about their health and anti-aging really has to do some form of resistance training. Yeah, one thing that, that I benefit uh, greatly from resistance training is I, I'm a pretty anxious guy. I wouldn't call it debilitating, but uh, I do. I struggle with anxiety. And uh, the days that I don't train, I notice it's, it's a lot worse. So kind of like you, even if I don't uh, res uh, engage in resistance training, I'll still do some kind of cardio just because I, I guess it's the endorphins getting released or whatever, whatever that process is, but uh, it really helps control that anxiety and uh, be more productive. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. It, it just, uh, 
it, there's just nothing that makes you feel better really than exercise. It gets, gets rid of all that stuff, makes you more confident. You know, the anxiety goes away. You feel more confident. Yeah. It, it's great stuff. One thing I noticed too, Dennis, I don't know if you, I, I'm guessing you probably do uh, experience this as well, but whenever I'm training, my mind is like an, an overdrive. Like I, some of my like best tweets or best thoughts about content to produce uh, always come while I'm, while I'm in the middle of training. And, you know, the, the way you train, it might kind of suck to have to take a minute to, to log that in your phone or something <laughs> like that. Uh, you know, you got to take a little bit longer rest period, but uh, yeah, I, I, I don't, I got enough. I don't know if you have any thoughts on exactly why that is, but I've noticed that I get in that like flow state in my mind whenever I'm working out. Yeah. I, you know, I, I don't know other than, than, you know, the, your, the, the circulation is gone, the juices are pumping, including, you know, your brain is working. Uh, catecholamines are upregulated. So these various hormones and chemicals that just, you know, keep you pumped up, they affect your brain too. It's something like that. No, but I definitely want to throw that out there because, you know, I've had so many good ideas while I'm training and uh, yeah, I, I've noticed that. Yeah, absolutely. Me too. Yeah. Yeah. So um, one of the last things I want to talk to you about, Dennis, is supplementation, you know, and that's a huge industry. And I think a lot of people are very over-reliant on supplements. Um, but I also think there are a lot of people out there who maybe because they've been duped by buying supplements that didn't live up to all the promises that they've kind of written them off completely. Now, I know in researching on your website, you have a, a page that's pretty much devoted to supplements. There's a lot there. You give a lot of great ex, uh, explanations about what the supplements are, what they would be useful for. And, um, you know, if somebody tried to, to buy all the supplements that, uh, you know, whether it's on your page or they find on Amazon or being sold to them in the gym or whatever, I mean, obviously, um, they'd be poor, right, from spending all the money on supplements. But uh, right. everybody, everybody has a budget of some, some kind that they can spend on supplementation. So... Uh, considering a guy who's listening to this, he's got a budget of, let's say, 100 to $200 a month that he can devote to supplementation. Uh, what are the, the hardest hitting supplements that you would uh, suggest him to get on right now? Well, uh, first of all, I, I, regard, regarding the expense of the supplements, uh, my, my rule of thumb is that uh, the more expensive a supplement, the less you're likely to need it. Um, there, there's a lot of expensive stuff out there that it doesn't really doesn't make any sense to me. Um, why I, I, do, I mean, why, why, why are you think the expensive stuff would almost uh, have to make good on their promises to an extent? Well, you, you know, it may, maybe it's something like the ultra processed food, you know, they, they, they pack a bunch of stuff in a, in a, in a jar or bag and, you know, put a fancy name on it and say, you take this, you're going to get ripped, you know, and then people go, yeah, okay. I'll, I want to get ripped. So I'll take it. And, it, it just doesn't work that way. Um, or because they're spending like $200 a month on this expensive supplement, they actually, uh, they have some skin in the game and they, they actually follow their diet a little bit better. Yeah. And... Yeah. yeah maybe, <laughs> maybe so. Right. Um, so anyway, um, you know, what, what, are the, uh, what can they use? So, you know, the very simple things like, like for weightlifting. So the two that I take uh, that, that have to do with weightlifting are the whey protein, which I mentioned before, and I also take creatine. So, uh, and, and the creatine, again, you know, that's like with the whey protein. I'm only taking it a couple times a week. So I'm not just, you know, massively taking a bunch of creatine, neither am I massively taking a massive dose of, of whey protein, but those can be useful for taking around workouts, you know, give you the protein. Creatine is a solid supplement. Um, it's probably, creatine is probably less useful for people who are already eating a very good diet with enough protein because meat is a prime source of creatine. Uh, but for example, in some of these studies where uh, vegetarians take creatine, you know, they, they get these startling results because they really need that stuff. Uh, um, it, it's, it's something that we naturally, naturally need. Um, so, the, you know, those are, those are two for weightlifting. And they're both pretty cheap. I think creatine is, yeah, is, right, creatine right. is extremely they're, cheap. Extremely cheap. Right, right. They're, they're, they're very cheap. Now, Dennis, as far as whey protein goes, what I know there are definitely a, a range of quality, right, that's out there for whey protein powders. Are there certain ones you would say to stay away from and others you might steer guys toward? Right. Well, so, uh, like, um, there are some, some very good ones. One, you know, some that are, that are 
cold, uh, uh, what do they call it? Cold processed, um, yep. cold processed whey, right? And so th those are good. Um, however, you know, you can go, you can go to an extreme on that end too. I mean, I, you know, I see like uh, grass fed whey, for example. So uh, the, the importance of grass fed meat, for example, is in the fat content, but whey has no fat in it there there there's no point in spending your money on grass-fed whey right that they, they, they'll try to convince you there is um on the other end this the stuff that i find that gets really bad is a lot of the ready-made protein drinks so a lot of these things that you, you know they, they're loaded with sugar or they have vegetable oils in them uh, they have they're made with uh, soy protein you know all this kind of stuff and you know there are some exceptions i think but you know for the most part most of those things i you know i i wouldn't go near them yep. um and and so you know the key the key for a, a whey protein is is just you know simple ingredients and and it doesn't have to be expensive okay so we got protein creatine uh, anything else well, for, you know, for weightlifting, that, that's all I do. I think that the, the evidence for, say, you know, uh, pre-workout supplements or, and so on is, is lacking. Um, and so I don't think it's worth it. Um, I, I did a, uh, an article a few months ago about so-called testosterone-boosting supplements. And so I looked at a whole bunch of these, uh, you know, 10 or 15 of them, 15 different ones. I looked at the best-selling ones. And I had never really looked at them before closely. And it was pretty, uh, it was very dicey, you know? I mean, they're, they're selling this stuff that, you, you know, you take this and it's going to boost your testosterone. And I, you know, I looked at the evidence, I looked at the ingredients and so on. And, you know, I didn't see a single one that I would take. I would not want to take them. In, in testosterone, basically, you know, if you have some kind of deficiency, uh, like for example, you probably know about the well-known supplement ZMA. So it's it's uh, zinc and magnesium and aspartate. So if you have a if you have a deficiency of zinc or magnesium, taking those things will boost your testosterone. Question is, why do you have a deficiency of zinc or magnesium? You shouldn't. You you should be eating properly and not you know, not having a, a a deficiency of them. And that's why if you look in detail in some of these studies. They, they go to a place like, uh, they go to a country like Iran and they give ZMA to these guys. Wow, their testosterone goes boom because they were deficient in zinc and magnesium. Uh, they try it on somebody in this country who's well-nourished. Mm, nah, it doesn't really work all that well. So uh, these testosterone-boosting supplements, maybe you could take those as an as a, as a example of the you know, broader range of supplements. You shouldn't be having deficiencies uh, uh, if some of these things are not a required nutrient and they boost your testosterone, then you should look at it as, as a drug um, because that's what it's doing. So there's going to be side effects. There, there's risks as well as benefits. Okay. Now, what about supplementation just for general health reasons? You know, you mentioned vitamin D earlier, uh, vitamin D, maybe probiotics. Uh, what are your thoughts on supplementing like right so uh, I mean, do, you, do you need that or is that just you get you get that through your diet well some some of these things uh like i mentioned vitamin d and vitamin k2 so those are both fairly difficult to get in, in your diet vitamin d we get from the sunshine and typically uh you know above 37 degrees latitude which i think is right uh, through your neck of the woods uh, about about the same as uh you know right here you know above above san francisco um, if you're north of that and it's not the summertime, you are not getting any vitamin D from the sun. It's just not strong enough. We do store vitamin D in our bodies for, for some length of time. Um, but typically by, by the end of the winter, if you're not taking vitamin D, it's pretty well depleted. So I take vitamin D in the winter. I take the less of it. In the of that, Dennis, uh, you may be able to go into more of this, but just some of the consequences of low vitamin D. I know depression is is one that's often linked to low vitamin. Uh, oh D. yeah, there, it, it's it's pretty huge. It's involved in cancer and heart disease and and all kinds of things. It's just it's just a really necessary vitamin, uh, you know, for, for everything. Yes, depression, like you say, 
and, and so on. So what about testosterone? It, Cause I've, I've heard uh, people say that even having, having low vitamin D can, can negatively affect your testosterone production. Yeah, absolutely. Right? It can. Yes. Um, yeah, so there, there have been studies where they've given vitamin D to people with low testosterone, their tos- testosterone goes up, that's an indication they were vitamin D deficient. There's still a lot of debate on what's the proper amount of vitamin D. Um, uh, there's been this, in my view, over, over concern about possible toxicity for a long, long time. And so physicians were very reluctant to do it, but toxicity in vitamin D happens at just huge doses. Um, so it, you know, for the, for the ordinary person taking a, you know, a moderate dose of vitamin D, toxicity is very unlikely. Uh, vitamin K2 is another one that I take. So vitamin K2 is, is relatively difficult to get in the diet. It's, it's found, and mainly in pasture fed dairy products. So, you know, we typically don't eat a lot of those. Something like Kerrygold butter is, is a source. That's that's butter that's from pasture fed animals. So I take vitamin K2, very important. Uh, it's it's complementary to vitamin D. And it uh, in, in my case, it's a particular interest because it fights arterial calcification. Uh, so basically, it's going to make sure that the calcium in your body is going into your bones and not into your arteries. So I, I take uh, vitamin K2 every day. Uh, another one I take, and um, I'm just going to say this personally because I never, I, I never recommend. I always tell people you got to talk to your doctor about this. But I take a baby aspirin every day. So um, I believe that this is a, a good thing to take, especially for a man my age. Um, and, uh, but there are risks as well as benefits. It's a very individual thing. So if people are interested in taking that, they should get medical advice on, on that. But that is an over-the-counter, uh, not a supplement, it's a drug, but it is over-the-counter. Okay. Now, vitamin K two, uh, Dennis, is that a is that a pricey supplement? Is it pretty pretty affordable? I'm, uh, I'm uh, it, it's a, a little bit expensive, but it's it's not bad. Um, you can you can find it on Amazon. It's it's not that expensive. It's um, like thirty it bucks a month, something like that, or beg your pardon, like thirty bucks a month, something. In oh, that like, range less or? than less okay. than that. Okay. Yeah. All right. So the last thing I want to talk to you about is testosterone. So the overwhelming majority of our listeners today are going to be men. So testosterone, obviously a big deal for them. Uh, low testosterone is a big problem right now. And I'm sure you could talk about some of the myriad factors that go into that. Um, I want to start by asking you about soy because you were talking about uh, protein shakes. And I know, you know, I see guys at work that come in and they have these protein bars and and all of them, I mean, if you go to like a, like a quick trip or something, almost every protein bar you see in there, it's exclusively soy protein or the majority of the protein in it is soy. Um, and, you know, there's been a lot of talk about soy leading to estrogenic effects in men. And uh, I wanted to get your thoughts on that. That's, is soy something guys should absolutely stay away from or is uh, just making sure you're not ingesting a ton of it, uh, more, a more measured approach? I... Uh... Yeah, you know, cer- certainly if you had a little bit now and then, it's, it's it, you know, if, if you ate something and you found out there was soy in it, I mean, I wouldn't, you know, go, go wild over it. But yeah, generally speaking, yes. So, you know, you want to go purge? <laughs> yeah, right, right. <laughs> um, yeah, defi- definitely avoid soy. Um, so, boy, there's a lot we could say about this. Soy, soy is, uh, you know, is a crop that is cheap and profitable and they want to put it in everything instead of healthier ingredients. Um, it does have protein in it, but it also has these phytoestrogens in it. There's a, there's a lot of, uh, you know, solid scientific concern over soy in foods, especially for infants and children, uh, because they're developing and there's, there's concern that these phytoestrogens could basically permanently rewire some of the the uh the sexual capacity of that if that's a word i want and that's basically um, the main protein in a lot of the baby formulas as i understand it. yeah it's 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 absolutely crazy I, I i can't i can't believe anybody would feed that stuff to to a child to an infant um so and as as far as 
for mangoes, yes, I, I advise that they avoid soy and certainly in any kind of quantity. Uh, the phytoestrogens, you know, there, there's, there's concern about it and there's, a, there's debate about it. But in my view, there's no reason to be eating soy and better to be safe than sorry. In, 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 in my view, I, I take the view that yes, there, there's plenty to be concerned about there. Um, so yes, you know, it, it, some people like to point out that, oh, well, uh, the Chinese and Japanese have been eating soy for, you know, thousands of years and, you know, they do okay, whatever. But there's a big difference. The kind of soy that they eat has, has been fermented. So probably very early on, they realized that you didn't want to just eat soy. You know, if you had to eat it, you wanted to ferment it and get this noxious stuff out of it. So they have things like uh, natto and tempeh and soy sauce and whatever. Uh, but the kind of soy we're talking about here is basically just dried soybeans that they 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 put into the food. So yes, I I advise people to to I advise men and and women should avoid it too. Yes. Yeah. Avoid. Now as far as uh, enhancing or maybe a better word would be optimizing testosterone. Um, you know, I, I went and got tested, uh, I guess about a year and a half ago now. And I, I, I was at a moderate level. I, I think my uh, total testosterone was like in the five sixty range, something like that. Um, which I'm personally not happy with to me. I, I want to have an optimum level. So, you know, I, I don't haven't really quite figured out how to go about doing that yet legally, <laughs> but, uh, uh, I would like to, to have that optimized, but, um, I want to get your thoughts. So guys who I, I definitely recommend every guy listening to this needs to get tested. If you haven't already, probably do that every six months to a year, make sure, you know, you're, you're still at healthy levels. And if you get to the point where, you know, a doctor will prescribe you replacement therapy or whatnot, I, I definitely would recommend looking into that. Um, what are your thoughts on that? And also are, are there any ways that guys can naturally enhance their testosterone? Well, uh, yeah, there, there are a lot of things there. There's this, uh, there's this what the, what's called a secular decline in testosterone. So what that means is that there are two things going on in declining testosterone in men. One is as you get older, testosterone typically declines. And then there's this so-called secular decline, which means basically a man uh, my age has typically has lower testosterone than a man the same age did 30 years ago. So it's all going down and that, you know, that's worrying. So there's a lot of debate on what's going on there. The, the simple, the, the basic things that men can do is, uh, are, are, there are a few basic things that men can do. One is don't be obese, don't be overweight. Fat tissue uh, leads to aromatization. So it leads to more, more estrogens being made out of the testosterone and estrogens feedback on luteinizing hormones. So it lowers testosterone production, vicious cycle. So you don't want to be overweight or obese. Um, you want to have, uh, you want to have high muscle mass. And so, uh, you know, relatively lean with high muscle mass. Um, there are other things, like I mentioned, about, uh, in regard to the ZMA supplement, you want to make sure that you have adequate zinc and magnesium. Uh, there are some other things, vitamin D. Uh, you want to make sure those are adequate. Most of those, if you have a good uh, diet of whole minimally processed foods, you, you will be fine. And magnesium and zinc, you might need to take some vitamin D. If, you are, if you've been eating like crap, for a long time, you may need to take some magnesium and zinc. Um, another thing is alcohol. So alcohol has an aromatization effect, and I'm sorry to say that because I, you know, like to have a drink myself. But it does, uh, you know, light to moderate drinking is likely fine. But if you're if you're overdoing it, that that's going to affect your testosterone level. So those are, uh, you know, some very basic things that that men can do. Probably this long-term secular decline in testosterone, a lot of it has to do with the obesity epidemic, with the, the proliferation of these crap foods that everybody's eating. Um, so yeah, there are so many factors that are kind of increasing in a, in a similar, you know, trend, right? I mean, you right. 
chemicals in the environment. You have, you know, plastics and yes. all, all this stuff that, you know, it, it's all increasing. And you know, how, how do you, how do you attribute one thing right. to what's going right. on, right? It's probably a conglomeration of all this stuff. Right, right. It's a good question. It's, it's hard to disentangle all that stuff. Yeah, it is. Well, Dennis, I don't have anything else for you. Is there anything else uh, you wanted to cover today that we haven't gotten to? Um, I don't think so. I think you, you, you asked me some very, very good questions. So, you know, I, I appreciate you having me on. Yeah, no, I appreciate you being on. And uh, before we drop off, let uh, our listeners, who I'm sure are intrigued by our conversation today and got a lot of value out of this, uh, let them know where they can get more of your content and connect with you. Oh, okay. So my website is roguehealthandfitness.com. Uh, they can find my, my books and my programs there uh, as well. And then I'm uh, very active on Twitter. My handle is Mangan, M-A-N-G-A-N 150. Um, and uh, yeah, that, th there are a few other places I hang out, but th those are the main ones. Awesome. Well, I will definitely link to uh, those resources in the show notes. Uh, so make it easy for guys to find you, Dennis. Again, thank you, man. It's a great conversation that uh, our listeners are going to get a lot out of, I'm sure. All right. Thanks so much, Greg. Appreciate Thank it. You.